The law of God governs the entire universe. This is the same law that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob followed. This law was codified through Moses on Mount Sinai. Today, this law is all but forgotten in America. Discover how this law can bring you either blessings or curses. Learn how this perfect law of liberty can be followed today. We're going to finish up the Ten Commandments on murder and adultery. A quick outline of what we're going to do. We're going to do a review of property rights and then the last five commandments because that's where we're at. Then we're going to talk about you shall not murder. And these are all the titles of law that I found about murder. That's murder, manslaughter, diet and health. Obviously, diet and health, it's going to hurt you physically. That's why I put that under murder. Clean and unclean animals, agriculture, animals, bearing children, male discharge. That's going to be uncomfortable, so I'm just going to warn you. By the time we get to uh, male and female discharge, um, I'll probably be more uncomfortable than you. But... Uh, Great. It's part of the scriptures, so we're going to talk about it. No. Menstruation is going to be even more uncomfortable. <laughs> Sanitation, circumcision, and healing. Believe it or not, circumcision will be a lot easier to talk about than those other two. <laughs> then we're going to talk about you shall not commit adultery. That's marriage, adultery, and divorce. So that's where we're going. I'm giving you a heads up. There's some things that might be perceived as uncomfortable. If that bothers you, sorry, but... <laughs> it's in the scripture. God put it there for a reason. We should probably look at it. Before we begin, and you're probably sick and tired of this slide too, but remember the law of God is good for us. It's for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. We always need to remember it's good for us. The law of God defines our righteous living. It doesn't give us righteousness, but it defines it. The only way to understand God's law is to do God's law. This is still one of my favorite verses. A good understanding of all they that do His commandments. We're never going to understand God's word until we actually start doing it. Uh, James said the same thing. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because it deceives yourself. So until we start practicing and just going for it and saying, God, show me how to do it as I do it. You know, that's when He really starts to teach you. When studying the law of God, we err when we treat it as a religion. It is a law and needs to be studied as law. This is really important. I think, we, I think Satan's biggest deception is religion. And, um, you know, I, I keep saying that, but I don't know if you can tell by now. This is one of the last lessons. It's clearly a national law. It's not a religion. And uh, we're going to see more of that today, hopefully. Israel was a nation, not a church. We need to compare Israel with other nations. The law of God is a national law. So instead of looking at Israel compared to the church, we're going to compare Israel to America, which is what we've been doing so far. And finally, the law of God is compared to a mirror and should be used to look back at yourself, not towards others. So, I mean, if you just look at the life of the Messiah, he was not a very judgmental person. Yet if there was ever anyone that lived, wouldn't he be the one most qualified to judge others? We need to follow that example. So the whole point of this is to see what we can change about ourselves, not other people. So when I studied the Mosaic Law several years ago, I came up with 756 commandments, statutes, and judgments. They were codified into 87 titles of law, at least that's how I saw it. Uh, all 87 titles of law fit under the Ten Commandments, which fit under the two greatest commandments, to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And um, as you can see, this, this came straight from the Messiah himself. That's, that's where it comes from. 
Uh, we looked at pretty much everything except for you shall not murder and you shall not commit adultery. The first five commandments are our relationship with God. And the last five commandments are our relationship with each other. The last two, last week we talked about our policy commandments. They tell you how to administrate God's law. Uh, covet is really what you call intent in law today. And perjury is how a court administers God's law. Today we're going to look at you shall not murder and you shall not commit adultery. There's not a whole lot left and then we're going to be done with all the commandments. Cool. At least that I count it. The last five commandments are all about property. Property is the highest right a man can have to anything being used for that which one has to lands or tenements, goods or chattels, which no way depends on another man's courtesy. It's a right, it's not a thing. It's a big difference between the way we think about it. The right and interest which a man has in lands and chattels to the exclusion of others. So if you have a property right, you can literally say, this is mine and you can't have it. And God wants it that way. It's not always selfish to be thinking that way, but we have property rights. God ordained it. And sure, we should share and we should be generous, but the reality is we should protect our property rights. That's what the Eighth Commandment is all about. It is the right to enjoy and to dispose of certain things in the most absolute manner as He pleases. All things are not the subject of property. The sea, the air, and the like cannot be appropriated. So obviously no one can own the, the oceans. That's not fair. No one can own the air. If you did, you would have a monopoly on the world. So uh, the house, the goat, and the tractor, that's the subject of property. That is not property. Your right to, do, to those things is what property is all about. So the last five commandments establish all property rights. The last five commandments are you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, and you shall not covet. And the whole reason I wanted to explain this is really you shall not steal is the only one that sounds like to us is about property rights. But the reality is they all are. You have a right to breathe. So no one can murder you. You have the right to be healthy. You have the right to have all those things. You, you have the right in your spouse. You have a right in your spouse. If you're married to someone, nobody else can take that from you. You, you see what I'm saying? It's a, all these are property rights. And because we've lost sight of what the definition is, we've kind of lost sight of some of these things. Okay, so uh, you shall not murder, you shall not, shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal has to do with property rights, bearing false witness, and coveting has to do with how to administer God's law in court. <laughs> Alright, you shall not murder. We're going to go fast through some of these because a lot of this is very common knowledge. There's eight statutes that I found. You, thou shalt not murder. Obviously, you're not allowed to kill somebody. Plain and simple. Some people need killing. Some people do need killing, but murder is taking away a property right without cause. Maybe there's a cause. Too. There, there might be a cause, you're right. But murder is taking away a property right without cause. Okay, if there's a cause, the, but that ain't my right. I can't take, if, even if I still, if I see you murder somebody else, yep. in cold blood, I'm not the one to kill you. The court system does it. You see what I'm saying? So I don't have the right to do that. I don't administer justice. That's what the Levitical priesthood was for. That's what the judicial system is for. outside of his jurisdiction. Yes, definitely. Murderers are to be put to death, so this is a capital felony. You are not to stand against the life of your neighbor. So if you have evidence to testify, you're supposed to testify, especially in a capital, uh, capital offense. You shall not kill the murderer before he stands for trial. Uh, the manslayer die not until he stands before the congregation in judgment. Everybody gets a trial. Killing for hire is condemned. That means the assassin and the one who hires him are both guilty of murder. Okay, so cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person. And all the people shall say, Amen. They're both guilty. It's a capital felony to, to murder someone for hire. Unsolved murders has kind of an interesting take on it. The elders and judges of a city, when there's an unsolved murder, shall take a heifer to a rough valley and behead it. The Levites shall investigate diligently and then wash their hands of the murder, asking God to forgive Israel. So there's a process they, uh, that we're supposed to go through. So if it be known who had slain him, if it not be known who had 
killed someone, then the elders and judges will go out to, the, to, a, to a valley and the elders of that city shall take a heifer and strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley. So they're going to kill, kill a, a cow um, to, to make a vow. The priest shall come near the city and shall try every word at trial. They went out to where the man that was slain was right. to do this and they investigated all the near cities. And if they the found city. nothing... If they found nothing, then they do the vow. And, and they, they make the vow to God. Yes. Yes. It doesn't take care of... It. We're supposed to investigate, but the reality is we have hundreds of unsolved murders in America. What do we do? We have to leave it in God's hands. There's, there's nothing we can do. Well, I personally believe we should. I do too. But we're not. Yeah, but if we did the sacrifice, God would take care of business for us. I, I think we, I think we'd see a lot more of God's power if we followed all of His commandments right. than we do now. America, the first lesson I did, I compared. I counted up. We started out at about seventy-six percent following God's law. We're now at about twenty-six percent. When America started, we saw God pretty live and direct. I mean, work in the affairs of, of America. And now we don't see it anymore. And I think the reason is our obedience. So this doesn't mean they're not going to look. They're going to diligently search, have a trial, and investigate to solve. And after everything's been looked at, now they're going to leave it in God's hands. The elders of the city shall wash their hands over the heifer and proclaim their innocence, saying, We did not do this. And that's them leaving it in God's hands. So we don't do this today, should we? I do believe we should. I think we have every right to do it. It's an eternal statute. Uh, has America ever done it? Is there any nation still doing it? Probably not. But that's probably why we don't... I personally believe this is why we don't see God acting as much as He could. If uh, you remember some of the things George Washington said about America being founded, he clearly described God acting in America to, to protect his people. America still keeps this law, but with a few exceptions. Abortion is the killing of children. We make an exception for murdering kids for some reason. But this is not passing your seed to Moloch. You guys remember me going over that. Mm -hmm. This is child sacrifice. The Bible mentions both. It talks about passing your seed through the fire to Moloch, and then they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood. So people did both. Okay? Uh, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. But why did they do this? I don't know if you've ever looked at some of the scientists who, who've studied this. Child sacrifice, if you look at the historical accounts, most historical accounts were from enemies used as propaganda during wartime. So if you go to the... Car, uh, to, to Carthage, where a lot of, it wasn't them writing about it. They didn't write about themselves sacrificing at all. It was other people during wartime writing about them. A lot of people think it was just propaganda that they weren't really doing it. The grave sites in Tophet, that's I think that's Carthage. Um, in 2010, Schwartz and his colleagues used dental remains from 540 individuals to argue that the site was not primarily for ritual child slaughter. The, term, uh, the team argues that many tooth fragments found at the Tophet were actually developing tooth buds from the jaws of fetuses and stillborn babies who could not have been life sacrifices. They go on to explain the reality of what they're doing is not much different than what we do with abortion. We just have better technology. So when they had a child they didn't want, they'd offer it up. It wasn't that they were just doing some weird religious thing. There was a reality behind it. Okay, and, and we do the same thing today. It's a wicked reality. It, it is a wicked reality, but the point I'm making, it's not any different than what we're doing for abortion today. We're just better at it. Yeah. We're more deceptive, and it looks a lot cleaner, and it, it doesn't come across the same way. I'm always trying to study this, realizing people from thousands of years ago aren't that different than us. They're just as connected to their kids. It was probably a really hard decision. It wasn't just, you know, I'm just going to kill this baby because I want to please this God. There was a reason for it and a reality, reality behind it. We're, we're doing the same thing. It just looks a little different. We're sacrificing kids and it, it's called abortion today. And it, it feels better in our minds. But it's still sacrificing kids. We do this out of convenience today. We call it abortion. Israel did it out of convenience as well. If they had a child they didn't want, or if it had a condition that they didn't want to deal with, 
They'd, they'd offer it up and they'd get rid of the child in much the same way we do today. Did he, no, I'm not condoning this at all. I hope it's not coming across that way. I'm not condoning it. What I'm doing is showing a similarity to today and what they were doing. It's just differences in cultures. Their culture handled abortion that way, sacrificing. We handle abortion in a hospital and kind of hide it from ourselves. Either way, it's murder. Either way, it's murder. It's of innocent lives. Yeah, that's the major exception we have with murder today in America. Manslaughter, I found six statutes. Manslaughter is not punished by death, but a city of refuge is given until trial. So cities of refuge are to be appointed um, so that he can go to be away from the avenger and uh, everyone that kills a man unawares, in other words, this is manslaughter, they weren't aware of it, they accidentally killed someone, they get to flee to that city and be safe until trial. And then if found innocent, they can stay in that city until the high priest dies. I'm actually jumping ahead. Uh, the city of refuge shall be among the Levite cities. Doesn't that make sense? The judges should house the city of refuge. They understand the law. They understand how wrong it would be to go against the judgment of the court. You shall not kill the manslayer before he stands for trial. When the high priest dies, the man is free to leave the city of refuge without harm. So this time limit can vary quite a bit. If, if I'm, you know... 20 years old and I'm guilty of manslaughter, I could go to the, the city of refuge with the Levites and I'm there till the high priest dies. That could be a year from now or 50 years from now. So this could be a pretty significant time. If you're guilty of manslaughter, you've killed a man. It's not a crime, but it's drastically going to affect your life. You now have to stay in this city for the rest of your life, possibly. If the slayer at any time leaves the city of refuge, he is subject to be executed by the avenger of blood. All that is is a kinsman of the person who died, right. who's, who's, his job is to kill him. So he's enforcing this law that you're staying in that city. If he was found murdered, or guilty of murder, then he would be the one to execute him. But it would be after a trial, and they would sentence him to die at his hands. But if the high priest dies, the avenger of blood is still around, right? Yeah, but he, he's free at that time. Yeah. He's not supposed to be killing him. And I guess the intent is, if enough time goes by, that Avenger's anger's probably been... Yeah. It, it probably takes a while to get over murder. Yeah. But I think events, enough time goes by, manslaughter. But still, you, when you've lost a loved one, yeah. it, it, no matter what, whether it's manslaughter or murder, it's going to take a while to get over it. Yeah. If a murderer flees to a city of refuge, he is to be turned over to the hand of the executioner that he may die. So this is not for someone who's found guilty of murder. They don't get to flee there. All right, health is also a property right. I mentioned that earlier. You have a right to your health. So diet and health, I found seven statutes. <clears throat> you shall not eat blood. The peace offering is so that we don't eat blood or fat. Okay, the functions of blood are what? Well, supplies oxygen to cells and tissues. It supplies essential nutrients to cells like amino acids, fatty acids, and glucose. That's what it does when it leaves your heart and is going to your organs, tissues, and muscles. But as it's coming back, it's removing carbon dioxide, urea, and lactic acid, which is waste products. Can you see where I'm going with this? Yes. It's not healthy to eat. Because it half, at least half of it contains waste products. Okay, so that's why God would have uh, put this law up there. We're not supposed to eat blood because it's not healthy for us. Animal fat is the same issue. We call animal fat saturated fat today. And saturated fats are mainly found in foods that come from animals such as meat and dairy. But they can also be found in most fried foods and some prepackaged foods. Saturated fats are unhealthy because they increase LDL, that's the bad cholesterol levels, in your body and, incre and increase your risk for heart disease. Saturated fats increases risk of heart disease and stroke. This is probably something we've all heard a million times here in America. But that's the reason why. Fat and blood are not good for you. You shall not eat an animal condemned to be stoned. That's probably pretty self-explanatory, but if you look into it, I just used mad cow disease because the most <laughs> the, eat, the, the meat we eat most of is cows, right? But if you look at the symptoms, the first one is aggression. 
And you notice up here, if an ox gore a man, he's to be stoned and you're not to eat it. If you look up a lot of the diseases for animals, one of the first symptoms is always, almost always aggression. So if an animal is showing aggression, they've probably got some sort of a disease. Now there's a good, there's a good chance it has, but it doesn't necessarily have to, but it's, it makes perfect sense not to eat an animal that was condemned to die. You shall not eat an animal that is killed by another animal. That's common sense. You shall not drink boiled milk. I'm going to explain this because most people don't agree with me. And I'll be honest with you, my wife doesn't even agree with me on this when we go through this. There's, the, there's a couple that we, we disagree on. But I'm going to explain why I think this. And there's other theories as to what this commandment means. It says, you shall not see the kid in his mother's milk. This is said three times. Um, why? Well, I'll explain to you why. Here's some raw milk facts. Raw milk contains beneficial enzymes. There's over 60 of them. Without these enzymes, you cannot digest milk fat, sugars, or calcium. So immediately, if you don't have these enzymes, all the fat is bad for you. It's like animal fat now. Raw milk contains beneficial bacteria. You cannot live without this bacteria, and raw milk is the primary source that you get this bacteria from. Raw milk contains vitamins. These vitamins are destroyed by pasteurization. In fact, all of this is destroyed by pasteurization. There are zero health benefits to milk when it's pasteurized. You ever notice how in the past 100 years, milk used to do a body good? Used to be good. It was the miracle food. Now it's horrible for you. What's changed? Pasteurization. pasteurization. Is it boiling? Yeah. Pasteurization is boiling the meat, the milk. So why the mention of in its mother's milk? Well, remember this was an agricultural society and I think this just gets us caught up on this. The only milk available is from the mother. Milk is produced after birth. So we raise goats. If I were only eating or drinking our milk, the only milk available to every kid I was going to boil would be from its mother. This would just be a common phrase. In fact, we all, Rochelle and I almost, the one thing I have over her in discussing this is we almost use this phrase because of it. Mm -hmm. When we were milking our goats, we would talk about the mother's milk. So I think this is just a common phrase they would use. You shall not see the kid in milk or its mother's milk because that's the only milk that would be available. Okay. Why would they boil milk? To try and get rid of the contaminants. Or Did they know about the contaminants? No. no. I think it was just a boil. But boiling milk is a modern thing. The only reason they would boil milk is to cook food. They would not have boiled milk for the sake of boiling milk. We're the only ones dumb enough to do that. Even though they didn't understand about the contaminants, they wouldn't have done that. I also don't believe this is a prohibition against eating meat and milk together. The main reason is Abraham served God butter, milk, and a calf. So there's, there's ways people try to say this, so I'm not trying to knock... Um, you know, that theory. But I don't think God would have sat down at a meal and specifically, we're going to hold the milk until uh, three hours, or I don't even know what the time minutes. is. 50 minutes after I eat the, the meat. Okay? So if God ate ma meat and milk together, it can't be against the law. So this would kind of endorse uh, what I was saying. A couple of questions though. Why do we pasteurize? Well, it's to kill harmful bacteria. Where does harmful bacteria come from? <laughs> Unclean facilities. Why not simply keep the facilities clean? It's much cheaper to just boil the milk than regulate clean facilities. So the reality is they don't care how much junk gets in there. We're just going to boil it all out and not worry about cleaning the facilities. And then sell you the milk. The beauty for us, there's only two states that even allow raw milk and California is one of them. Yeah. We're one of the only two left that is held out to allow raw milk. Now you can still get it at just about every state. What you do is find a local farmer to just buy it from. They just can't sell it as food. Yeah. But I don't know. I just know California is one. We, we go to Sprouts and we buy raw milk. Here's the downside. It's about 15 bucks a gallon. Yeah. That's the downside. But how do you know the facilities are clean? Well, you, you don't. But the, <laughs> I haven't been sick from it yet. They, they, they are regulated. And okay. I would imagine to make sure someone... Uh, I should have put this in here, but there were some statistics to show 
The harm from raw milk is so rare you have to worry about just about any other contamination in food other than raw milk. Does it taste the same? Yeah, it does it taste the same to me. I, I like it. Uh, but my personal opinion, the reason I like this is studying the benefits of milk and what we've done over a hundred years and the, the change that's gone just in the media from it's super healthy a hundred years ago to now it's horrible for you, don't ever drink it. The only connection is pasteurization. And I, I'm personally convinced that in its mother's milk is just something, it's just, it's just a phrase they use because if you're a small farmer, and I'm not calling myself a small farmer, but we have four uh, females that breed. When we were milking them, we w you would use in its mother's milk on a regular basis because that's who it was. It was the mother's milk that you would have. Now, when you get big and industrial, it probably doesn't matter. But at the time, they were a small agricultural society. They probably had lots of them. But when our animals breed, it's never the same day. You can, get, you can uh, breed them on this day and six months later, they're, they're still, that, that due date is never accurate. You know, it's just a guess. And there, it, it changes quite a bit. So it does it say, don't boil a kid in its mother's It milk. says, you shall not seethe. Seethe is a King James word for boil. Okay. You shall not boil a kid in his mother's milk. Okay, so what shall you boil it in? Well, you can boil it in water. Water okay. wouldn't harm you at all. But the practice of boiling it in milk kills is milk. dangerous. It kills the milk. So I think it's a milk statute, not a meat and milk so statute. pasteurization kills the milk. Yes, it You're does. Dead now, nothing. the reason we have such high heart disease is all that milk fat is now like animal fat. And we're guzzling it. You know, it's, it's not good for you. So we're, we're drinking a lot of milk that we think is good for us. And the reality is they're, they're truthful. It is bad for you today because everything's pasteurized. Me either. Well, and milk nullifies the acid you need to digest the meat. But that's, that's only pasteurized milk. Yeah. If you have uh, a raw milk, it gives you the enzymes for digestion. For digesting the meat. Yeah. So if, if I'm stuck in a situation, we actually buy... Di um, Digestive enzymes. We'll buy them from Sprouts or wherever, sometimes online. And it's the enzymes you need for digestion, which the milk no longer has. If I'm stuck and I don't have raw milk, I always take some of those before I drink the milk, just to make sure I have the enzymes. Do you drink your goat's milk? We used to, but boar goats don't produce a lot of milk. It was, it was, it was too much of an effort. It, it just wasn't worth it, so we, we kind of stopped. But when we were doing that, we st I noticed myself at least started thinking along the lines of using phrase, phrases like this, because it is their mother's milk. Mm -hmm. And you're stealing from the kid when you're taking their mother's milk. Mm -hmm. And, and it, you just get into that mode of relationship, because right. the kids are still feeding off their mother's milk. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it, it, it comes to be a, a natural thing when you're in that agricultural type of society, I think. And uh, that's the way my mind started going. Going, which is why I made this connection. Notice it just says goats. It doesn't say anything about sheep or cows. Yeah, well, that letter of the law, it, it applies to cows, it applies to sheep, it applies to everything. God gave us the example. We need to apply it appropriately, and I think it applies to everything. And you now, you now know my opinion. There's a lot of opinions out there. I think it's about pasteurized milk. And I think that's the dangers. Um, go, you can read it. The the, that's what I think it's about is the boiling of the milk. I personally just ignore the in its, mother, in its mother's milk. Some people have argued it's cruel. It's like, but they weren't boiling the kid in front of their mom, you know, <laughs> twisting their arms and it, with an evil face or something. They weren't doing that. They, you would have you done it away from the mom and it, it wouldn't have mattered. Those are just arguments that never really made sense to me. You may not eat an animal that dies on its own, but you may sell it to foreigners. This one's, this one kind of, I don't know if I have a great answer to it, but I, I don't want to, stranger, remember there were three words for stranger, Zer, Nikar, and Ger. This is going to shock you, but this is actually the word Ger. And if you look in the Septuagint, it's Perokos, which means having a home near by dwellers, alien, resident, foreigner, sojourner, stranger. You'll find out that parochos refers to either stranger. But ger typically refers to one. This is one example where I think the Septuagint was right. And remember, the Septuagint is over a thousand years older than the, than the Masoretic text, which is the one that the apostles were using. So I think it's referring to...
the heathen strangers, not the guests. And here's why, because the other, in Leviticus 17.15, it's the same statute. It says, every soul that eats that which died of itself, or that which was torn with beasts, whether it be uh, one of your own country or a stranger. The stranger can't eat it here. But in the other one it said you can give it to the stranger. So I lean towards the Septuagint on that just for that reason. The stranger that can eat this is the heathen. But that doesn't answer the question, why is God allowing the heathen? We shouldn't be endorsing, I don't know. Roadkill campaign. <laughs> it sounds weird. Welcome. <laughs> so I still have some issues with this verse. I'm waiting for God to answer some of those questions. But uh, the reality is that's what it says. You shall only eat clean animals. So that leads us to the clean and unclean animal statute. This is what clean and unclean means. There's ten statutes. Clean and unclean. Clean simply means clean, fair, or pure. Unclean is tame, which means to be foul, contaminated, polluted, or unclean. God created some animals to be clean, fair, and pure. That's food. And He created some animals to be foul, contaminated, and polluted. That's not food. That's, ba that's what those words mean. We've turned clean and unclean into religious words, and now it doesn't make any sense. It's just saying this is good for food, this is not good for food. Well, this stuff's contaminated. Care, the other ones yes. Other <laughs> Remember, God is our creator and designer. He made our immune system to protect us from disease. He made our endocrine system to regulate our hormones and chemicals. He made our nervous system so our body and brain can communicate. He made our muscular system so we might move and our skeletal system to hold it all together. He made our circulatory system to provide nutrients to all of these systems and our digestive system to process all the fuels to feed these systems. All of these systems and more work together to keep our body functioning properly. The final step in God's design is the right fuel to use. Just like a car manual informs you on what fuels and what oils go where, so does the scripture inform us on what fuel we should feed our body. Okay, should we put oil in the carburetor? No. Do you put water in the gas tank? Sometimes. Or sometimes, if you don't know what you're doing. Do you put gas in the radiator? No, you got to put the right fuel in the right spot. God is the designer of our body. He said, this is the fuel you need. So God told us how to eat. He said animals with divided hooves and chews their cud can be eaten. So if, if it has a split hoof and it chews the cud, it can be eaten. The flip side of that is animals that do not divide the hoof or chew the cud cannot be eaten. What so if they don't, the cud? chewing the cud, I'm getting to right oh, now. Really? But then he distinguishes this is and, not or. He says the swine, though it's cloven hooded, but it does not chew the cud. It's got to have both. This is and, not or. It's not chew the cud or divide the hoof. So that's why he put the swine in there saying, look, there's the distinction. It's got to have both. Well, what are we talking about? These animals are what we call ruminants. All of these animals have four chambered stomachs. Mm -hmm. Okay, that means they eat only plants. Their food is thoroughly digested four times, mm -hmm. which creates better meat. All of these animals have a much cleaner meat that we eat from them. Okay, animals that, don't, that aren't ruminants don't have that. Chewing the cud means they upchuck it, yeah. chew it some more, and it goes in the next stomach. Well, yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Four times. It's, it's multiple, it's eating your food multiple times, basically. So it's digested very thoroughly. So all those animals eat plants, and they digest their food very thoroughly, and that makes the meat much better for us to eat. Fish that have fins and scales can be eaten. But all water life that does not have fins and scales cannot be eaten. If you look and study what these are, that means fish that do not have fins and scales are bottom feeders. They're all scavengers. They are the cleaning system for the waters. They're cleaning up all the junk, all the disgusting stuff on the bottom of the floor. Is their meat going to be healthy? No. No, it's not. Unclean birds is not as clear. Okay, it just lists what's clean and some that are not, or what's unclean. Okay, the eagle, the ossifrage, which is a bone-eating bird, osprey, which, which is a sea eagle, vulture, kite, raven, owl, nighthawk, 
Kukau, I don't know how to pronounce that, Hawk, Little Owl, Cormorant, Great Owl, Swan, Pelican, Gear Eagle, Stork, Heron, Lapwing, Bat, and all flying animals that creep on all fours. The one thing you'll find out, and I looked up every animal listed, these are all birds of prey or scavengers. That's what they are. We are not to eat birds of prey or scavengers for the exact same reasons. They're the cleaning system of the land. Ducks are okay. Chickens, ducks, are okay. Chickens, ducks, ducks. ducks is one of those gray areas that you'll hear good arguments either way. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't get mad at someone for eating a duck. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have much desire to. But there, there's people yeah, that will argue guess. both sides. Keep in mind, we should not presuppose our classification system on God's. Mm -hmm. He didn't classify them like our scientists have in modern days. We have families and all sorts of different... That's not the way God classified them. You never hear about meeting a chicken. Anymore. Yeah. God called a whale a fish. We don't call a whale a fish. I think God was right. Because there's a lot of similarities with a whale and a fish. But because it you know, breathes air and it's, we call it a mammal and we put it in a different classification. You see what I'm saying? So just because we classify it this way, if we, we will run into a lot of scriptural problems if we take our scientific classifications and put it on the scripture. So how do we know that that was classified as a chicken back in? We don't. That's what they, this, is a, this is, like I said, this is a gray area. The scripture is not clear. What we do know is these are unclean. So we shouldn't eat these. That's what I would say. Uh, the ones that aren't listed, you know what? We're, we're, we're going to have to pray about it. We're going to have to use our brains and think. And the determination I made is these are all prey and scavengers. I know you guys are dying to eat some insects, so I'll tell you which ones you can eat. The locust, the bald locust, and the grasshopper you can eat. Okay? So all those that leap with all that have uh, legs above their feet. So insects with legs to leap are herbivores. They're plant-eating. Other insects are scavengers. So, so crickets, are okay. crickets are okay, believe it or not. Now, I've never had a desire to eat one. Yeah. 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 They have flavored ones at the gas station. Yeah. They do. Yeah. They have chocolate. I've heard about that. But I want to try it. I can clearly see the point. If someone were to offer me a bag of crickets or a bag of cockroaches, it's an easy choice. Yeah. It is an easy choice. That's all you got to eat. It, it does, it, it's not even a question. Yeah. So it makes sense, but in America we don't we don't eat insects. <laughs> all that walk on their paws on all four legs are unclean. If you think all these coyotes, cats, these are scavengers, and they're they're, they're they're all scavengers. They'll eat whatever's put in front of them. If they run into a dead carcass, they're going to eat it. I mean, we don't want to eat these animals. All creeping things are unclean. Um, turtles, mouse, weasels, we're not to eat those either for the same reason. They're all scavengers. All that crawl on their belly are unclean, so snakes, we shouldn't be eating. I know that's popular for some people. And, and all that have multiple legs or feet are unclean. So millipedes, centipedes, all those are unclean to eat, so we shouldn't be eating those. So God made some animals that are clearly good to eat and some animals that are not. Yes? So... The people in Africa or what, you know, they're real thick, they can only, they only have bugs and stuff to eat? What, are they being held accountable for this? I think God holds us accountable at a level based on our knowledge. You know, he, he said he winks at their ignorance. But then when they're given knowledge, this is in the book of Acts, now they're a, a, accountable. But you miss out on a blessing. Yeah, you miss out. So you're, you're losing out if you're ignorant and not following God's laws. So the more you learn, just remember, the more we're accountable. So we should start following it. But that's when you know it here. I don't think it's because someone... Some people told me I should follow God's law years before I started following it. I don't think I was accountable until I knew it was true. And there's a big difference. We're reaping a lot of the blessings because of the way we've started. We're nothing like other nations. Yeah. Our national average is 75, pushing 80 now, yeah. as far as our years. And God said He will give us the number of our days, which is 70, 70 years or 80 if you're strong. So we're still reaping the blessing right now as a nation. So I don't, I don't think we've gone so far. We're actually following most of God's... We don't cook up most of these animals commonly in America. Um, the worst is pig. We, 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 we cook up pig too much in America. Okay, so a quick summary. We can, we can eat all animals designed as food. These animals all have healthy diets. We cannot eat animals that scavenge or hunt. These animals God designed to clean the earth. It's His design system. If, if, if living out where I live, 
I probably shouldn't say this, but we, I did this once when we had, I didn't feel like burying one of our animals. I just put them in the brush. Next day it was completely gone. Completely gone. It died of some sort of sickness. I didn't want it around. Normally we'd burn it or something like that. I just put, I knew the coyotes would get it that night. Sure enough, at night I heard all the howling. The next day it was completely gone. Not a, not a fragment left. So they do a great job. Oh, they no. do a great job. It, it's almost like God knew probably what he was doing. Looking for seconds every night. You know? yeah. That's why I didn't want to stay. It was probably a bad idea. You don't really want to feed them. One question I wanted to put up here. Did any of this change because of the cross? No. Are, the, are unclean animals now healthy? No. no. Nothing's changed because of the cross. It all changed because of Peter's vision. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, agriculture has five statutes. Some of these are repetitive, but they needed to be in agriculture so that if you're looking up agriculture, you know. You shall leave the corners of your field for the poor and stranger to glean from. We went over that last week. You shall leave the gleanings of your field for the poor and stranger also. This is welfare versus workfare. Welfare is government benefits distributed to impoverished persons to enable them to maintain a minimum standard of well-being. Welfare is communism. The mantra is co of communism is from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Do you see how that's what it does? We just give it out and give it out to even everything out. Workfare is different. Workfare is a system of welfare in which unemployed adults are required to earn their public welfare benefit by performing public service jobs provided by the government agency. Amen. This is God's system. Didn't they do that Paul commanded the Thessalonians, if any would not work, neither should he eat. Okay, so God's system is you work for your food. You shall not plant mingled or genetically modified seeds. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. This is not spreading seeds out and planting multiple different plants in the same field. Okay? Mingled seed is kalayim. I'm probably saying that wrong. The definition means two heterogeneities. Okay? Remember, it is the seed that is mingled, not the field. This refers to genetically modified seeds. The reason is found in a supporting statute. God does not allow GMO so that our fruit is not defiled. The other statute is Deuteronomy 22.9. It says diverse seed is the same word. And it says it's so that your uh, fruit is not defiled. It damages your fruit when you mingle them, when you genetically modify them. It's a health statute. God designed our food and it was good. We need not try to change God's design. So, grapes without seeds, is that something? It's genetically modified. Okay, so that's... Try and find a watermelon without seeds today. It's not easy. Try to find one with seeds. Oh, with seeds, that's what I meant. That's, I said it backwards. They have on that cardamom. I like it with seeds. Yeah, and cardamom. You shall not eat fruit of a tree during its first three years. Um, if you do some research on that, they're not fully developed yet. They don't have all the nutrients needed. But the fourth year, they are to be given to the Levites. They're holy unto the Lord. So once they're finally good, the first fruits go to the Levites. Animals have property rights also. However, I wanted to make this disclaimer. These rights do not match human rights. So I'm not going the route of trying to say we should protect all animals. But they do have rights. For example, animals are not to work on the Sabbath. They get a day of rest. Okay, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. In it thou shalt do any work, nor your cattle, nor any of your animals. Keep newborn animals with the mother for seven days. The eighth day it can be offered. We talked about this on Tuesday. Okay, this is just good common sense. You get a newborn baby, it needs to be with mom for a while before, so it can get established. If we leave our goats out with other goats, it's going to get picked on immediately and possibly hurt or damaged. But if you give it a week by itself, it's going to be strong enough to fend for itself. It's going to be the lowest you know, man on the totem pole, but it's still, um, it's, it's got a chance. Separate the mom and that baby. We, we built two stalls where we just lock them up. And we actually have two separate I can lock them up in a big area or in a small stall about 10 by 10. I put the mom with the baby. It's a lot of, for the first couple of days, you got to make sure that the, the kid can nurse. Right. And a lot of times they don't. We've had goats die on us because we weren't there to help it latch. 
And if, he, if you're not there to assist it sometimes, if it's in the wild, it's just the probabilities it's playing. It's going to lose a kid here or there. We have a, a lot of triplets. And when there's a triplet, if we're not there almost every time one dies. Because while it'll have the first one, it's so busy with the next two, it ignores that first one. Wow. And it doesn't get any nutrients, but it's got to deal with so much. They're not really, I don't know if they weren't intended to have that many, but we ha we're there almost every time and we have to pick it up and help it, you know, nurse. A week is a very good common sense number. So I would say God was right on this one. Oh, oh that one. Yeah, just that one. <laughs> you are not to breed animals of diverse kinds. No hybrid animals. This is the same thing. The gender with a diverse kind is the Hebrew word rob. It means to squat or lie out flat. That is specifically in copulation. So we're not supposed to breed animals together of different kinds. It doesn't mean you can't keep them penned up together. It just means you're not supposed to breed them. Some animals will breed together, some animals will not. You know, we get a mule from a horse and a donkey. We should separate horses and donkeys because they can breed. But a goat and a horse, we don't have anything to worry about. I, don't, I would not have a problem putting a goat and a horse together. It doesn't mean keeping them in the same lot. It's specifically for breeding. A goat and a sheep, they make geeps. What I think is interesting what I think is interesting is very few scientists have connected this, but this literally disproves evolution because a geep cannot reproduce. A, a mule cannot reproduce. The minute you change the genetics just a little bit, reproduction is impossible. In law it's called a collateral estoppel. Yeah. So it's like God put a collateral e stopple, you change just enough, no more. <laughs> and it works with plants too. So why, why, why evolutionists believe that evolution could be possible with evidence like this? That's why you buy genetically modified seeds, you have to keep buying them. You can't pick the seed from your apple and plant it and grow it, it won't. Yeah. So, to me, that, that's such strong evidence evolution could not possibly be true, but you really don't hear about it. Yeah. They just completely ignore it. You'd think some creation scientists would bring it up, but I've yet to hear that. Yeah. But just that alone totally refutes evolution. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. This is genetic modification. GMO animals causes food allergies, increased toxicity, decreased nutritional value, and it also becomes antibiotic resistant, which is probably their main purpose. Mm -hmm. But that, that you guys probably know how that can be damaging as it is. The more resistant we get to it, the less it works. You shall not slaughter an animal and its offspring on the same day. I think this is compassion. We talked about this on Tuesday also. Mothers in the animal world do mourn their offspring. And we see that every day. I mean, every time we butcher a, a goat, it's one of the young ones. And the mom is mourning for a couple of days at least. We've had goats literally just looking around their cage, wandering for about two or three days. And it's kind of sad. It really is sad. It's sad. <laughs> the eggs or young can be taken from a bird's nest, but not along with the mother. So when you're out in the way, that means you're traveling, you shall not take the dam with the young, that it may be well with you, and that thou may prolong thy days. Why would he say this? This is to pre preserve the animal population. If you think about it, this is when you are in the way, you're traveling, and you need food, you find a nest. You can't take the mom and the eggs. That's going to hurt the population. Preserving the animal, animal population will be well with thee that thou may prolong your days. You want to take care of your environment so it continues pr to provide for your needs. If you kill the mom and the eggs, no one's left to pre reproduce. So you need to make sure that we preserve nature as it is so it continues to feed us. That's just good common sense when you think about it. You are not to have two different kinds of animals work together. That just makes sense. Look how big this ox is compared to the horse. It's une the New Testament mentions being unequally yoked. We're not supposed to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Animals, the original statute is you're not supposed to make them unequally yoked. Can you imagine a goat and a horse pulling side by side? That poor goat. <laughs> that's, that's not going to be fair. You're going to have this tealed round... Yeah, it's not going to work. <laughs> That's obviously an extreme. But, yeah. you know, the picture I have up there is an ox and a horse. The ox is a lot bigger than the horse, and that's not fair. You shall not muzzle the, the mouth of the ox that is being used for work. So these animals are allowed to eat while they're working. So if they're 
pulling a, a plow and they want to stop and grab, you know, forage or eat whatever's on the ground, they're allowed to do that. These are animal rights. It's nothing like the animal rights they're pushing today. Sanitation has 16 statues, and there's some interesting ones in this. All that touch a dead carcass are unclean until the evening. Pottery is to be broken. Okay? It shall be unclean. When they are dead, it shall be unclean. Wood, raiment, skin, or sack, it shall be unclean. Every earthen vessel. If it's pottery, if it's an earthen vessel, you're supposed to break it. Okay, everything whereupon any part of their carcass falls, it shall be unclean. This this makes sense. If we touch a dead body, we're unclean. What about what's that pottery thing? Really? Well, if you think about pottery versus uh, pottery is very porous. It is going to be almost impossible to clean it. What is it saying if a dead animal falls? If a, if, a, if 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 a dead animal touches it, contaminates your pottery, you're supposed to break it. Okay. Otherwise, somebody's going to put water in it. Yeah. Drink it. One thing to realize, unclean is Tame, that we already went over this, but it's foul, defiled, or polluted. Being unclean is not sin. This is just a reality. The Messiah dealt with the sick several times. He would have been unclean several times. It's not sin. A modern definition might be sick or contagious. So when you read unclean, think along the lines of sick or contagious or contaminated. It doesn't mean sin. We've turned that into a religious word and all of a sudden everything unclean is sin. Yeah. And it's not. If you touch a dead animal, you must wash and are unclean until evening. Isn't that just common sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, how many of you guys, uh, you know, a possum dies in your yard and you got to pick it up. Don't you feel dirty? I, I want to put, exactly, put gloves on and you're probably not unclean. Right. But if you do touch it, let's say you step on it by mistake, or who, who knows what happens, yeah. you are unclean. What if you're, you, you have a, a relative that passes away and you have to deal with the body? I mean, the reality is you're unclean. This is just common sense. He that touches the carcass thereof shall be unclean until the evening. The sick are to conceal their condition, cover their mouth, and alert others. That makes sense? We do that today. You know, the Asian countries do that a lot more than we do. We don't really do it like the scripture really says. But I'm constantly telling my kids, cover your mouth when they cough, even though they're not sick. It's just a good habit. Um, but the scripture really says, put a covering of, over your upper lip, and let people know that you're unclean. Now, if, if, the way people word it, unclean, unclean, is like a weird ceremonial ritual thing. That's not what, It's just saying, hey guys, I'm sick. Stay away from me. That's all it's saying. It's just common sense. We do it, but we see a religious word like unclean and we go into some weird ritual that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Garments worn by one who has a contagious disease are to be burned. That makes sense also. We don't do that. Yeah. And the spirit of the law might allow, because we have bleach and different type of cleaners, to just be able to wash it and be okay. Mm -hmm. The spirit of the law is to make sure that we're not going to infect somebody else. A house with a contagious plague is to be quarantined. So then the priest shall command that they empty the house and shut up the house seven days when there's a contagious plague. This plague is what we would call mold today. So when you, we find mold, we'll just keep people out of the house for seven days. If the plague remain, the stone shall be taken away and the house scraped. So you're going to start tearing apart your house and scrape the house um, if the plague's still there after a week. If the plague remained, the house is to be rebuilt and sanitized with essential oils. If you know anything about essential oils, they disinfect. But, and then he shall break down the house, the stones of it, and the timber thereof, and all the mortar of the house, and he shall carry them forth out of the city into an unclean place. And if the plague had not spread in the house after the house was plastered, then he will cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and with the running water and with the living bird and with the cedar wood and with the hyssop and with the scarlet. Now, I'm not going to try and explain what the blood of the bird is, but the two birds letting one go and killing one, that is the cleansing offering. What the blood does, I'm not sure. Now, I've looked into it a little bit because you know how birds can, they can navigate using the magnetic field of the earth. And a lot of scientists think it's related to their blood. They, they travel when they're migrating using the magnetic field and a lot of scientists connect it to their blood.
That might be why they're using a the bird's blood. You know, I know your ma magnetic field has to do with frequencies and stuff. Maybe they're... Who knows? Yeah. We just don't have enough science to it yet. But there's something... There might be something there. I have no idea. But it's the cleansing offering, and we're supposed to scrape this stuff down, clean it, tear it all down, and start all over if necessary, and then disinfect it with essential oils. The spirit of the law is to clean and sanitize your home when you find mold. The process of how is the letter of the law and not nearly as critical. Uh, you shall bury blood in the earth after slaughter. That makes sense. God, the earth is God's filtration system. It cleans everything out. You are unclean for seven days when you touch a dead body. I already went over that. You shall quarantine diseased people. We think the word quarantine is really bad. And then he shall be brought uh, abroad out of the camp. He shall not come within the camp. Obviously, when he gets healed, he can come back. But the reality is he's saying, you know what? You're supposed to be out. You shall bury your bodily excrement in the ground outside the camp. I put up a picture of a septic tank. That's the way we used to do it. Now we just float it down the river to the next city and pump it full of chemicals and let our next city drink it. But that's <laughs> pretty much what we do. That's true. It is absolutely true. There's no, I'm not making that up. It's speculative. They go swimming in the water. It yeah. it's, it's kind of disgusting what we do, but we think these chemicals fixes it. But, you know, that's one beauty of having a well. God's filtration system cleans it. And that's, it, that's kind of neat to me. It's, well septic yeah, we're on a well and a septic so tank. It's, it's, it's really kind of neat. But that's, that's what it d does, is it puts it out there into the dirt and lets God's system clean it instead of floating it down the river for our neighbors. Okay, this one's interesting. I'm surprised most people don't pick up on this. But the purification water. Yes. You hear a lot about that red heifer. Yes. It makes perfect sense if you really connect the dots. The priest shall have an unblemished red heifer which has never been saddled, burned outside the camp. Okay, so he's supposed to take a red heifer, no one's ridden it, no blemish, without the camp, slay her, and then burn her. Okay, that's what he's going to do. The priest shall cast cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet wool onto the burning heifer. So you burn the cow and put all these things on it. The priest shall have a clean man gather up the ashes and store them outside the camp for the purification water. So he's going to take all these ashes and put it right outside the camp. And they're going to use those ashes to mix with water and bathe with when you're sick. When you touch a dead body. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it so far? Those unclean by touching a dead body are to wash in water mixed with the ashes of uh, mixed with the ashes the third and the seventh day. After seven days, the purification's over, and everything that uh, touches the dead body are to be washed in water mixed with the ashes. Guys, this is an ancient practice that works. Washing in ashes goes back thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Volcanic ash has been used for health for centuries. Mm -hmm. It disinfects the blood. It stimulates bile secretion. It aids the oxidation uh, uh, reaction in the body. It protects the protoplasm of cells. And it's for the synthesis of collagen, which is basically skin. Mm -hmm. Wood ash does the same thing. It's been used for centuries. It maintains pH balance in soil, it de uh, deters insects, it absorbs odors, and it's a cleaner and a disinfectant. And mulch. So, so what do we do? I'm going to explain a little bit more. Washing in ashes. The first soaps were made by the ancient Babylonians around 2800 BC and utilized a mixture of animal fats and wood ash. When ashes from hardwoods are boiled in soft water, it creates lye. That's what soaps were used to be made of. When lye is mixed with animal fats or vegetable oils, it renders a soft soap and a little salt to the mix when pouring the molds to make it a, a firmer bar of soap. Now this isn't the exact same thing described in Leviticus or in this statute, but you can see how these are the ingredients to soap. What I think it's more like is what you'd call activated charcoal today. Anybody ever use activated charcoal? In 2004, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence recommended that ambulance services should carry single-dose activated charcoal as an antidote to self-poisoning. What it does is it goes in your blood system or in your stomach 
and the activated charcoal clings to every toxin and then you just pee it out. Mm. It works. We, we actually did this at our house and I meant to bring a tub of it. I forgot. Um, but we, we had uh, our first set of labs that we started breeding. R Rochelle would even tell you this story. We were sitting there getting ready to go somewhere and one of them came running up and Rochelle just go, this isn't my dog. Because his head was swollen like a basketball. And we looked, there were two fang bites right in the top. It got bit by a rattlesnake. I called the... Um, no, the veterinarian, and, and they said, well, he, he's going to die unless you come here and we give him the antidote. How much is the antidote? About $1,000. Okay, thank you. And I hung up. And we immediately went, well, this was our plan. We will use the activated charcoal. We made a paste. I put it on the back of the neck, right by the, the bite. And then we made him ingest some. In an hour, the swelling was completely gone. It looked like our dog. Wow. Hmm. Wow. That quick. I was I was shocked. It's not like Kingsford chop charcoal. Is no, it? you, you, you <laughs> They do it in the ER when you've taken... Like, they still use it. Oh, that's interesting. And then they put a lavash through the nose and then you throw it up. The top 10 uses... Th this stuff actually whitens your teeth. It alleviates gas and bloating. Treats alcohol poisoning, which prevents a hangover. Cleanses mold, water filtration, toxin removal, skin and body health, digestive cleanse, anti-aging, and reduces high cholesterol. In fact, I think Shannon made me a toothpaste out of it, huh? She makes it. You you gave Rochelle a recipe. I think you didn't make it, but you gave Rochelle your recipe. Oil and activated charcoal. Yeah. Soda, bentonite clay. And yeah. Soda. This stuff works really well. It's it's amazing. It it grabs the toxins and just pulls them out. It's just it, it 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 it's like a magnet to these toxins. And I think that's what this water was for. It was like an activated charcoal paste. And we've just lost sight of all this because we'd rather use chemicals. Mm. And chemicals aren't very good for us. So when you had this problem, you'd go mikvah, bathe in this activated charcoal-like thing to purify you. That's exactly what it would do. This is a great purification for an unclean person. Yes? You said it reduces your cholesterol, so you eat, eat, you eat it or something? Yes. 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 You, you ingest it. We, we, we have them in capsules and we have a big tub of it. You take the tub and you make a paste and you put it on the injury or, or whatever to get it in your blood system. That's the best way if, if it's a bite or something. Or if it's some sort of a poison. That's why they said the ambulances. If someone ingested poison, it, it was for suicide treatment. You'd, put it, you'd make them eat it and it would grab the toxins. And I imagine enough of it's going to make you throw it back up. Right, sometimes they'll put it through a nose for a yeah. G2. So it, it, it used to be a common practice that my research showed that most ambulances don't. Some of them might have it, but they don't use it anymore. And I'm sure it's a money thing. But I'm convinced that's what it's doing. It's just practical. It makes sense. Why they would have it right there, right outside the camp. You'd go get it and you'd bathe. It would take a seven-day process. At the end, all the toxins would be removed from your body. All right, here's the uncomfortable part. Great. Sexual discharge. Oh, so I warned you guys about that, but we got to cover it. Leviticus 15 is about sexual discharge. It's about unnatural male discharge, natural male discharge, natural female discharge, and unnatural female discharge. And I'm going to go over this in an opposite order to help understand. Um, but. Well, I'm just going to do it anyways, no matter how awkward it is. Natural female discharge. We call that menstruation today. Okay? Here, I'm going to go through the laws and then I'm going to explain it. Menstruation will be for seven days. Okay? She shall be put apart seven days. Put apart is the Hebrew word nida, which means rejection. That means personal menstruation. It's referring to the menstrual fluid. Menstrual fluid is composed of blood, old parts of the uterine tissue, mucus cells, and bacteria. Has a higher risk of toxicity. The discharge cleans out the female reproductive system. This is why it is unclean. It is not sin. People have treated it like sin. It's a natural bodily process to discharge uh, toxins or unclean things. Everything that touches the menstrual blood shall be unclean. That should just make sense. Anyone that touches the menstrual blood shall wash and be unclean until the evening. Sexual relations with a woman during menstruation is forbidden. That should also make common sense. 
Those who have sexual relations with a menstruating woman shall be unclean for seven days. So that, that's a longer period now. Okay, here's the statute in question, and there's a lot of controversy about this, and I want to explain. The controversy makes no sense. Okay, here's what it says. And if a woman have an issue, and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days. Everyone interprets that as kick her out of the house, and she's gone for seven days. And whosoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything that she lies upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sits upon shall be unclean. And whosoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whosoever touches anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And if it be on her bed or on anything whereon she sits, when he touches it, he shall be unclean until the evening. And if any man lie with her at all and her flowers be upon him, he shall be unclean seven days and all the bed whereon he lies shall be unclean clean. Here's some key words to understand. First, definitions. Put apart is the Hebrew word nida. This word means menstruation. It's the menstrual fluid. Her is not in the original language. See that her up there? It's not in the original language. The Hebrew words involved are naga, and, uh, which means to touch, and tame, which means unclean. This verse does not say not to touch the woman, but to not touch the unclean. It is the third person pronoun singular, he, she, or it. Her flowers is the word nida again. Why it's translated differently, I don't know. But that's menstruation. So I put my own translation using these words so that we can understand what it's saying. And if a woman have an issue and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be menstruating for seven days. Isn't that about right? Yeah. And whosoever touches it shall be unclean until the evening. What's the it? The blood. The blood. And everything that she lies upon in her menstruation shall be unclean. Is this meaning anything they touch now is unclean? Can she not sit on anything or it's unclean for a week? Or is it saying if she gets it on that, it's unclean? <laughs> <clears throat> Everything also that she sits upon shall be unclean, and whosoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whosoever touches anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And if it be on her bed, so it's the it we're talking about, is on her bed, or on anything whereon she sits, when he touches it, he shall be unclean until the evening. And if any man lie with her at all, and her menstruation be upon him, he shall be unclean seven days, and all the bed whereon he lies shall be unclean. Does this not sound a little different than putting her out of the house for a week when you use the words correctly? Yes? Does that mean the guy is not supposed to sleep in the same bed? Or I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. Touch the, the unclean. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Do we not do that today? I'm just going to be frank about this. If yeah. my wife had an accident, the first thing we do is clean it up, go wash the sheets, and get everything out. We wouldn't, I mean, this is just common sense, but we turn it into some ritual by kicking women out. It must have been, and they actually did this. Several cultures did this. Some people still do it today. I'll be honest, I wrote an article on this, and it is my most popular article by a long shot. I get more emails on it just from explaining this, because everybody thinks of it as something very disrespectful to women to kick them out. And that is not at all what God's saying when you really look at it. Now, let, let's, let's, let me... Um, answer some of these questions real quick and I think it'll help clarify. What is the topic here? Well, it's the it. It's the nida. It's the blood from the menstruation. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about separating women. If you read online, everyone says nida refers to the woman. It doesn't. It refers to the menstruation. There's a big difference there. Women are not to get it or this blood on anything. Why? Because it is unclean or infectious. And it is. Let's just be real about it. It's, it's unclean. If it gets on anything, we are not to touch it. If we do, we are unclean until the evening. It's just common sense. Remember, Hebrew women use sanitary pads just like women today. The filthy rags in Isaiah? Filthy is aid, which means the menstrual flux. It's a filthy, it's a men, it, filthy is a bad translation. It really is just, we should call it a pad. 
or you know what we call it today. That would be the best translation because we say, oh, they did the same thing. If that pad failed and the chair got contaminated, you got to clean the chair. And I think every one of us would do that, right? Yes. <laughs> so I, this is the conclusion to the article I was telling you about. The bottom, line, uh, the bottom of the line is this. There are three things that our bodies need to do that we are responsible to keep clean. Men have to deal with two of the three while women have to deal with all three. Both men and women need to keep their bodies and others clean after urinating and defecating. Women have a third responsibility due to their reproductive system. Since women have the ability to bear children, their bodies discharge on a monthly cycle. God has given women instructions on how to deal with this necessary but unclean discharge. That's all Nidah is talking about. So when people, I'm not joking, I get emails all the time about this article saying, I'm so glad I don't have to leave the house for a week. People are actually doing this. <laughs> I'm not joking. I, I, and honestly, they're wonderful people. It's, re it's really neat to see their heart going through something like this just to please God, which is what they're doing. But um, you know, the reality is that's what the tradition says. Is for a week, people would build their own little houses for their wives out of respect, so they could live in that for a week, and they couldn't have any contact. One lady emailed me and said, uh, it, "It's nice because she can for a week. She would hate not being able to hug her husband or give him a kiss goodbye." It's like, of course you can give him a kiss. Is there any chance you're going to get it on you? No. I mean, come on. What are the odds of that? But Steve, there is a command in this that the husband is not to have relations. So if he does, it is sin. Because well, it's yes, a it's a command not to. Sin. So that would be sin. The uncleanness is not the sin. Correct. It's the breaking of that command Correct. that's the sin. Correct. You're right. I would agree with that statement. Okay, uh, unnatural female discharge. This is related. If menstruation lasts longer than seven days, all the laws apply during the extended time. So everything we just went over still applies. Okay, so if a woman have an issue of her blood many days, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. See, separation is a bad, it's just the word nidda. In the days of her menstruation, we should just, I know it's not a fun word to say. I've said it like 30 times already and it makes me feel uncomfortable. But it, that's what it should say. When an extended menstruation ends, the woman shall wait seven days to be clean. Now, why does she have to wait an additional seven days? Well, odds are if it's an extended thing, there's some sort of a sickness or an illness involved. It's normal. After seven days, she shall offer two turtle doves or two young pigeons as a burnt offering and sin offering. There are several things that can cause an extended menstrual period. All of them are related to an illness. It can be you, you caught something, but there's a lot of them. I should have grabbed them because I saw a list of like ten things. If, if, what's that? Tumors. Tumors. There, there was a whole list of things that weren't, that weren't sin. It was just, hey, you've got this infection. It's, going to, it's lasting for two weeks long. Here's how you deal with it so that you don't you know, hurt anybody. That's why it's an extended seven, uh, seven days. You're now contagious. You're now, you've, got, you've got a sickness. You've got an illness. And now we need to you know, make sure that everyone's protected from it. Be tied to like a yeast infection? Yes, that's the word I was trying to think of. It's similar to a yeast infection, but I don't think a yeast infection actually well, causes this. But it, it, it's, it's similar to that. It's just a, a normal thing. Okay, natural male discharge. Male discharge, you guys probably all know what that is. If a male has a discharge of semen, he is unclean until the evening. Everything that touches the semen is to be washed and unclean. Notice how it's even saying touches it. It's the it we're worried about through this whole chapter. And we miss that because it starts talking about what you're sitting on. It says the same thing about the man eventually, but it's referring to the it that touches it. The man and woman are both to bathe in water and be unclean until evening. So it's assuming there's a woman involved. So what are we talking? We're talking about sex. We're talking about after sex, you make sure you're clean, you bathe, and you're unclean until the evening. Luckily, our practices are usually in the evening when you do that. 
Right. So it's not like it would last you a whole day where, where you might be unclean. But the reality is, in today's modern word, world, we can clean a lot easier than they could back then. The spirit of the law is to make sure you're clean. Unnatural male discharge is the same thing as what we talked about for female, but slightly different. If a male has an unnatural discharge, he is unclean. Okay, a couple of definitions. Discharge is, or the running issue up here, is zub, which means to flow, gush, issue, discharge. This is different than normal. This word sometimes refers to a woman's menstruation. It most often refers to the flowing of milk and honey. So what this word means is something flowing. So it's a continuous flow. That's not typical of a normal male discharge. You see what I'm saying? This is an infection going on for time. This is not necessarily referring to an STD or VD, but it can. It is referring to any prolonged flow from your body. The most common is a urinary tract infection. That is by far the most common. People get that all the time. So this is not sin, and sometimes we want to immediately throw the, the, the VD out there, which it could be, but the reality is the overwhelming majority of the time it is, is just a simple urinary tract infection. Now, if it were VD, why would we go through this? Almost all VD is a capital felony, and we, why would we heal them to kill them? Right. So, the, now not all VD is from that, but the reality is most of the time, I don't know if it would be talking about an STD or something like that. Because most of the ways you get STDs, you've been breaking God's law in a capital felony and you're supposed to die. Everything that touches the discharge is unclean and to be washed. So that just makes sense. This is the same thing we just went over with the woman. If vessels touch the discharge, pottery shall be broken and wood shall be washed. Notice this is for the illness part. This is the sickness that someone has some sort of a disease which is causing it. It's not necessarily a disease, but after seven days you shall offer two turtle doves or two young pigeons as a burnt offering and sin offering. So this is an illness. So a quick summary. The unnatural male discharge, this is a sickness and requires seven days to clean. That's the first part of Leviticus 15. The natural male discharge. This is natural and you are unclean until the evening. Honestly, it just makes sense when you think about it. The natural female discharge, this is natural and you are unclean for seven days. Well, this lasts for seven days. But the unclean does not mean kick them out of the house. Unnatural female discharge, this is a sickness and requires seven days beyond when it stops to be clean. Does that make sense? I think that's what Leviticus 15 is really talking about. And it amazes me how many emails I get about this very topic. But um, I'm, I'm pretty confident in this. Uh, if you were interested to get more details, I wrote a pretty long article. You could read it and uh, it should explain it. Question. Yes. So um, on Sabbath, then you, if you're married, you should not have sex? I would say the spirit of the law for unclean is if you can clean yourself, I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah. To me, that is exactly why God said the spirit of the law. Right. We need to know what God's intent. And the intent is to protect others from sickness. Right. If we can do that, I mean, I'll be, if you, they didn't have running water. To be able to hop in the shower and clean thoroughly in 15 minutes changes the whole ballgame. So, so if, if yeah. someone's convicted to not have sex for the, during the Sabbath, then they shouldn't. But if they're not, I wouldn't, you know, if they, if they didn't shower and clean afterwards, I'd say, yeah, you're probably guilty. Right. But, they, they, you know, but there's a difference there. We, we, we need to make sure that we're protecting people. And you're right. But that's, we, we each have to make sure, we each have to make sure we're following it to the best that we can. And it's different for men and women. Bearing children is a difficult one. Bearing children has eight statutes, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to have a very good answer for some of these, but women are unclean seven days after giving birth to a male child. Okay? They're to circumcise the male child on the eighth day. Women are to be unclean for 33 more days after giving birth to a male child. Women are unclean for 14 days after giving birth to a female child. So the number of days are different. They're unclean for 66 more days after giving birth to a female child. 
They shall offer a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering when the purification is done. Shall offer a young pigeon or turtle dove for a sin offering. And the poor can offer two turtle doves or two young pigeons as a replacement for the lamb if they didn't have enough money. Okay, what does all this mean? And I'm just going to tell you, I have no idea. <laughs> purification for a male basically is 40 days. The purification for a female is 80 days. I have no doubt there is a logical or scientific reason, but I don't know it. The reality is we kind of do this because the first thing a doctor tells the woman is uh, you can't have intimate relations for at least a month, usually longer, six weeks I think is what it is. So we're kind of doing it. There's just no distinction between a male and a female. And I am certain there's a good logical or scientific reason we're just not as smart as God yet. And when we are, then maybe we'll know. <laughs> Circumcision has three statutes. All males shall be circumcised on the eighth day. God told that way back in Genesis. Every man, man child among you shall be circumcised. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. But why the eighth day? The eighth day is unique. Vitamin K is responsible for the production of prothrombin. Don't ask me how to pronounce it, I'm guessing. Prothrombin. Is that right? Prothrombin? Prothrombin. Prothrombin. Without prothrombin, hemorrhaging will occur, or will most likely occur. This is required for blood to clot, which is necessary for surgical success. Now the guy who discovered this is Dr. McMillan, and he has an awesome quote that I wanted to share with you guys. This is what he said when he discovered it. He said, we should commend the many hundreds of workers who labored at great expense over a number of years to discover that the safest day to perform circumcision is the 8th. Yet as we congratulate medical science for this recent finding, we can almost hear the leaves of the Bible rustling. They would like to remind us that 4,000 years ago, when God initiated circumcision with Abraham, he did not pick the eighth day after many centuries of trial and error experiments. Neither he nor any of his company from the ancient city of Ur in the Chaldees ever had been circumcised. It was a day picked by the creator of vitamin K. Wow. <laughs> Obviously, this man was a believer. And uh, I, it was a pretty powerful quote to see that the guy that discovered it, I mean, he just laid it all out in that Dude's one credit, quote. Yeah. Credit's due. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, the eighth day is literally the perfect, but you can literally see charts that just say eighth day, boom. <laughs> it just, it's the, high, the high, best day, and then it comes back down on the ninth day. Hmm. So the eighth day is literally the best day you could circumcise a baby. Strangers and foreigners are to be circumcised if they live in the land. And you shall be circumcised in the heart. Circumcised therefore the foreskin of your heart. Circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is the covenant of faith. Remember when we went over that? Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. Paul quoted this. It's the covenant of faith. It represents the internal work of the circumcision of the heart. The transformation in our lives, the writing of God's law, or rebirth, whatever, however you want to put it, it represents that. Why do believers reject this sign today? You ever notice how so many people will say circumcision is not that important? It's not a law that needs to be followed today? It's not a law that saves you. There's no doubt about that. But we would never say about baptism, oh, don't bother with baptism, you don't need it for salvation. <laughs> If you're saved, you're going to want to get baptized, right? right? Why would we not want to follow one of God's laws? This one, in my opinion, circumcision gets neglected. The Abrahamic covenant is the covenant of faith. It's our covenant today. But there are tremendous amounts of health benefits to circumcision. No, I, I, totally, I totally get... If, if you're an older man and someone's telling you as an older man you need... It's none of anybody's business. Yeah, right. I know I personally would think, you know what, with modern science, it'd be a lot more comfortable than Abraham had it. Yes. I think I would probably do it just to be obedient. It'd still be uncomfortable. I'm not saying it wouldn't. Okay, healing has eight statutes. We always need to remember God is our healer. For I am the Lord that heals you. If you follow God's law, He will put no disease upon you like the diseases from the Egyptians. He said, I will not put disease upon you. Priests are to diagnose disease. 
So you're to bring him to uh, bring all the sick to Aaron the priest, and the priest shall look on the plague, and the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. So this is what we call diagnostic. He would diagnose the disease. Priests are to deal with the sick using reflexology. We've already gone over this. Reflexology is pressure points on the ears, hands, and feet using essential oils to help heal. Quarantine the diseased person. This is a duplicate statute. I already told you guys. I've got 15 to 20 duplicates in here because I couldn't decide where they go. Then he shall go abroad out of the camp. You shall burn incense or essential oils for healing. All right, when it says the leaf thereof is for medicine, that, in my opinion, is a reference for essential oils because essential oils are the circulating juices of plants. Okay, when they're talking incense, that is a dried form of an essential oil. What we have as essential oil is actually stronger, so it's kind of the same thing. Um, for national sins, however, Turning with repentance, faith, and atonement, and the disease will be withdrawn. So if we're engaged in national sin and God's punishing us as a nation, we need to fall upon our faces and repent, make atonement, and the plague will be stayed. I don't know of any American examples of that, but I'm sure there are some. When we receive plagues and diseases, we need to repent nationally for it to go away. Execute punishment for the sins of the people and the disease will be withdrawn. So they thrust them both through and so the plague was stayed. So if there's a serious crime, maybe one of our leaders or someone has committed and it's causing a national plague, that's what needs to be done. There needs to be national repentance and you need to punish the person responsible. Marriage has 18 statutes. I'm just going to go quickly and then I want to talk about marriage. A man shall leave his parents and cleave to his wife and they will become one flesh. <laughs> marriage contract is between the father of the bride and the groom. We don't do that today. Husbands have authority over their wives. Sometimes, well, we don't do that today either. I'll just say that, that we, we, I, I'm not being flippant you'll see what I mean by that we are not to marry those of heathen nations this is not a race thing it's not saying you can't marry someone of another race it's the heathen part do they follow God or not do they follow his law it doesn't matter what they look like a female betrothed to her master can be redeemed but cannot be sold to a foreign nation redemption is always by the father or the nearest kin Redemption is divorce. When they're splitting up, the dowry goes back to the family. We don't understand anything about that because we don't do dowries. But I'm going to explain this in just a minute. If a female is betrothed to the master's son, she shall be treated according to the custom of daughters. The custom of daughters is the bride price and dowry. A man with more than one wife shall not diminish one for the other. This is polygamy. Polygamy is okay by scriptural standards. So if I have one wife and I marry a second, I can't diminish the rights of that first wife. What does that mean, diminish the rights? Well, she, she, she has, a, she has a, a greater inheritance right for her children. That's what the manner of daughters oh, means. Okay. That's, that's right. Yeah. But that's illegal in the States, right? No, it's not. I'll explain it in just a minute. When the wife is falsely accused of not being a virgin, the father should bring the consummation bedding to the elders as proof of virginity. So, being a virgin before marriage is very important. It's not that being the virgin is important. It's the fraud. You have to be honest about it. Okay, because it's a fraud to lie to your husband about that. The tokens of the damsel's virginity, that's the consummation bed. We don't do this today. We probably should, but we don't. When the wife is falsely accused of not being a virgin, the husband shall be punished. So the husband's chastised. It always goes both ways to protect the woman so that she's not falsely accused. Because that would be completely unfair to her to be accused of something like this. When the wife is falsely accused of not being a virgin, the husband may not divorce her. So she can divorce him, but he has to stay married to her till she leaves him or uh, until one of them dies. A man must not remarry his wife if she has slept with another man. So if you get divorced, you can get remarried, but if she's married someone else and then divorced again, you can no longer 
remarry. He who has taken a wife is given a year to rejoice with her. God's honeymoon period is a year. We're, we're shortchanging ourselves very significantly. He shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife, which he has taken. <laughs> Don't you love the King James? King James, yes. <laughs> a newly married man is free from military and business for one year. So he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business. He's on his honeymoon. Yes. A widow with no children is not to marry a stranger. She must marry her husband's brother. This was the same one I had in the inheritance. This is really more, it's not as much marriage, but it's inheritance because I had this in the inheritance statute. It's to protect the brother's lineage. Oh, my. Okay, we don't do that today. It kind of creeps us out today. but. <laughs> and if we think of marriage biblically, which is where I'm going to go, it'll start making sense. But we've turned marriage into an emotion. Yeah, is this all going to come back into, at some point in history? In the millennium, we're going to be doing this. We're going to be doing all this. There's no doubt about it. Okay, there's some laws of a jealous husband, which is kind of complicated. Then I'm going to talk about what marriage really is. If a man believes his wife was unfaithful, but does not have any witnesses, he shall bring her to the priest with a barley offering with no oil or frankincense. Okay, if it be hid from his eyes, he doesn't know if she was unfaithful. He shall bring his wife unto the priest with a barley meal, no oil, nor put frankincense thereon, because it's an offering of jealousy, not for, you know, something pleasant, basically. The priest shall mix dust from the tabernacle floor with water from the labor and charge the woman with an oath while her head is uncovered. Okay, so they're going to charge her with an oath. All right, he's going to take it from the dust of the floor, uncover the woman's head, and charge her with an oath. The priest shall write these curses in a book and blot them out with the bitter water. Then he will cause the woman to drink the bitter water and wave the offering before the Lord and offer it on the altar. This is really kind of a crazy um, thing we got going on, but it, it starts to make sense when we read a secular writing. The priest shall write these curses in a book and blot them out with the bitter water. The woman's to drink the bitter water and shall wave the offering before the Lord. This is asking the Lord to be involved. If the woman is guilty, her belly will swell and her thigh will rot. If she is not guilty, she shall conceive seed and be guiltless. Her belly will swell and her thigh shall rot. You guys have probably figured out I'm a big fan of Philo of Alexandria. So I'm just going to read what he said about this. He lived at the exact same time as the, as the Messiah. And when you read, what he, it doesn't really answer a lot of the questions you have, but it starts to make more sense. Because I, to this day, don't know why you're picking up dirt, mixing it with water, making... There might be a logical reason for it, but I don't know it. Law of the jealous husband. This is what Philo said. He said, but cases in which guilt is only suspected... It does not choose should be investigated by men, but it brings them before the tribunal of nature, since men are able to judge of what is visible, but God can judge also of what is unseen. God says to the man who suspects such a thing, Write an accusation and go up to the holy city with thy wife, and standing before the judges, lay bare the passion of suspicion which affects you, not like a false accuser or treacherous enemy, seeking to gain the victory by any means, whatever, but as a man may do who wishes accurately to ascertain the truth without any fraud. And the woman having incurred two dangers, one of her life and the other of her reputation. If she be pure, let her make her defense with confidence. So the woman's making a defense. But if she be convicted by her own conscience, let her cover her face, making her modesty the veil for her iniquities. But if the charge which is made against her be contested, and if the evidence be doubtful, so as to incline to the either side, then let the two parties go up to the temple, and let the man stand in front of the altar, in the presence of the priest for the day, and then let him state his suspicion and his grounds for them. What's happening here? She's being put on trial. This is the appellate process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the part the scripture doesn't say much about. But Philo filled us in on all the details. It starts with a written accusation in the lower courts outside of Jerusalem. The woman makes her defense.
If the lower courts could not make the decision, which happens in all of our lower courts, mm -hmm. then they travel to Jerusalem to a higher court. That last paragraph was in Jerusalem. It was a higher court in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. If the evidence is doubtful, they will go to the temple and God will make the judgment. Okay? To me, what this tells me is how important marriage is to God. That He has put a provision for Him to make the judgment in some circumstances. He didn't do it for other laws. He did it for marriage. And infidelity in marriage. And a way to solve this problem when you don't know. What if the woman, can the woman do that to the husband? I personally, the scripture doesn't say one way or the other, but I personally believe yes. In every other judgment that was made in the scripture, God went both ways, equal rights for women when it comes to that. And there's nothing in scripture that says they can't. So I would say yes, but you don't find the judgment adjudicated in the scripture. To, to, to my knowledge, I couldn't, I've never found it. So why all the other stuff? I don't know. Uh, I'm not one to find religion in the scripture, but this is simply a way to let God make the judgment. And he will make the judgment by ruining her reputation, by making her belly swell and her thigh to rot. What a lot of people think the thigh to rot means is her reproductive organs. She's going to become barren and she can't produce and she's going to have damaged parts. If she's innocent, she's going to give child, which is exactly what God's capable of doing. If she bears children, all the proof in the world, she's not guilty. And that's all she's got to wait for. So I've been looking for a scientific explanation for that weird process that's going on. And I don't think it's science. I think it's just God. I'm more convinced after reading Philo that if God's using that process, it's God doing it. And God's making the judgment for the man and wife to, to determine this. So there are three types of marriage. This is what I was trying to get at, all right? There's a civil law marriage. This requires a marriage license. There's a common law marriage. This is a contract between the husband and wife. And then there's a patriarchal marriage. This is a contract between the husband and the wife's father. Which one's biblical? The two bottom yeah. Well, you know I love the common law, but there's a place for this when the father's not available. It's not entirely what the Bible describes, but there's a place for it because if the father's not available, who do you contract with? The woman. Yeah, what if the woman's all by herself? She, you know, the reality is Hebrew law requires that women are to be taken care of from birth to death. A man is to be taking care of a woman from birth to death. Her father raises her up and eventually transfers that, I don't want to use the word liability, but that's what the law books use. The law books use liability, but transfers the liability to take care of her to the husband. When the husband, if divorce happens, they go back to the father. And that's the way it's supposed to work. Mm -hmm. So women are always, it, this, that's a higher status for women. It's not a lower status. And our problem is we flip that thinking. Okay, what is a civil law marriage? Civil law marriage is a marriage license. When you repeat your vows, this is what the Ohio Legal Service says. This is what the laws in Ohio say. When you repeat your marriage vows, you enter into a legal contract. There are three parties to that legal contract. Wait, how many people are you marrying? One. You're marrying two people, believe it or not. There's a third party to this marriage. The state. <laughs> You, your spouse, and the state are the three people getting married. The state is a party to the contract because under its laws, you have certain obligations to the state and responsibilities to each other, to any children you have, and to the state. That's what a marriage license is. We used to not do this. Marriage licenses are new. Why are we doing it today? When did they start marriage licenses? They started in the 1800s after the Civil War. It, not everybody did it right away. It's only recently that everybody's doing it. But that's the process. It takes time. This is a three-party limited contract between the state, the bride, and the groom. The state writes the contract and is the head of the contract, which requires a marriage license. Wait, I thought God said the husband is the head. See, we don't, husbands, men are not the head of their households anymore. No, no By law, we're not. 
license. A license. This is what Black's Law Dictionary says. It's permission accorded by a competent authority conferring the right to do some act which without such authorization would be illegal or would be a trespass or a tort. This is permission to break the law. Which law are we breaking? <laughs> the common law, God's law. We're getting permission from the state Whoa. to break God's law. Do you know why? Do you now see why I keep saying these rulers are what the Bible calls gods? Mm. They're putting themselves in the place of God, and they're giving us permission to break God's law. Changing That's what a license is. Think about all the licenses we have. A marriage license gives us permission to break God's marriage laws. Real, realty license gives us permission to break God's land selling laws that we're not supposed to do. Driver's license, well that's the tricky one, but it, believe it or not, driving is an act of commerce. Traveling is not. Traveling is a common law right. Driving is engaging in commerce and the Bible calls it Canaanite trafficking. It goes all the way back to the traffickers in Canaan. It's forbidden in God's law. So when we, they tricked us, it's, we're not really engaging in commerce, but that's what we're getting the license to, which is why they can regulate it. Do you, do you see what's going on? This is what a civil law marriage is. Do you need a marriage license to be married? No. Nope. Did Abraham have a marriage license? No. Nope. No, it, it, it's not necessary. And our courts will rule based on the marriage contract you have. A common law marriage. A common law marriage is an agreement between a man and a woman to enter into a marital relationship without a civil or church ceremony. This is, a, this is why I'm not a huge fan of common law. There should be a public ceremony. Okay, there should. That's biblical. But the common law is not perfect. It's the, the best thing we got for God's law today. But you can still do that. But you can yeah. still do it. Yeah, you, there's nothing saying you can't. Right. Yeah. Okay, this is a two-party contract between the bride and the groom. There is no license and the state is not involved. Why do we want the state involved? We don't. No, we don't. Why would we want the state involved? So we can screw it up. A patriarchal marriage is the manner of daughters. This is what the scripture commands us to do. It contains a bride price, commonly called bride wealth. The bride wealth, also called a bride price or marriage payment, is payment made by a groom or his kin to the kin of the bride in order to ratify the marriage. Without a bride price, a patriarchal marriage is not ratified. In such cultures, a marriage is not reckoned to have ended until the return of the bride wealth or bride price has been acknowledged signifying divorce. So the bride price is a down payment. If the marriage falls apart, the bride price goes back to the wife's family. Do you see how this is her protection? Let's read on. A dowry, that's the property which a woman brings to her husband in marriage, now more commonly called a portion. It is given to the husband to be enjoined by him so long as the marriage shall last and the income of it belongs to the husband. Do you see how valuable this is? Income. <clears throat> yes. Well, the dowry does not belong to the husband, but he has control over it. Gotcha. When the divorce happens, he loses control of it. Yeah, we got that all messed up in uh -huh. India. We, well, India does bride price. They just do it wrong. They do it all wrong. Yes, they do. They burn the wife when it runs out. They've got it backwards. Yeah. We're better off with what we're doing probably than what India is doing. Yeah. A portion is the share falling to a child from a parent's estate. Portion is, is especially applied to payments made to younger children out of the funds comprised in their parents' marriage settlement. Do you remember the uh, inheritance we talked about? The portion is the inheritance. The firstborn male gets the double portion. The rest of them get the portion. Women get their dowry. They, fathers take care of their daughters until they marry them off. And then they give their inheritance and it becomes part of the marriage. If I were selling my daughter, I would get a high bride price. Because that bride price becomes her dowry. And then whatever I add on top of it. And it's the wealth of my daughter that she brings into the marriage. Do you see how this is her protection? And what you add to it, the dowry? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Okay. If, if I didn't have anything to add, the bride price would just be the dowry. But a good father is going to add some to it. What you're trying to do is set up your daughter to have success in her marriage. And I'm talking business now, you guys, not emotional success. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a female's inheritance. The husband is the head of the marriage in this one. Literally the head. So this dowry belongs to the husband. But if they get divorced, 
That dowry, all of it goes back with the wife, with the woman. So he loses out on divorce. Do you see how this is going to protect marriage? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Can you see that? Yes. What if she get divorced because of her fault? Yeah. There, it, 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 yes, it, it, it does. If he divorces her or she divorces him. When we get to divorce, we'll actually see, we'll see an answer to that. Okay. Do you see how we're, we've been conned into doing something God doesn't want us to do and it's to our detriment? Yeah. We should be writing our own contracts. Why would we not write our own contracts in marriage? Instead, we're taking the state's contract and going by their marriage, which is why if we want a divorce, we've got to go ask their permission and follow their rules for the divorce. If you want a divorce in a patriarchal marriage, you look at your contract. Did they break the contract? You can have a divorce. So it makes people think through their marriage and stipulate, this is what I want in a wife, do you meet the, will you do these things? Yes, I will. Now, this is what I want in a husband. Will you do these things? Yes, I will. Now, we can seal the deal and get married, have a public ceremony, consummate. Marriage is basically agreement, a contract, a contract with consummation. Once you have that, you're married. And our courts honor that. You can go into court with a patriarchal marriage with the contract and they will adjudicate accordingly. They know how to do it. It's not difficult. We just don't do it. The father gives the bride away because the boy paid the bride price. The father is divesting himself of the liability of his daughter. He's required to take care of her. The boy is accepting the liability of the daughter. Now the boy is required to take care of her. And in case of divorce, that just flips back. Or to the next oldest kin. If the father's dead, the oldest brother. That brings up polygamy. Polygamy is the offense of having several wives or husbands at the same time. Or more than one wife or husband at the same time. Notice how it says offense? Mm -hmm. It's not an offense in the scripture. We think of it that way today. If he take him another wife, her food or raiment and her duty of marriage shall not be diminished. How can it be sin if God regulated how we do it? If God gave us laws on how to do it, how is it sin? We think it's wrong and it's not. You can have multiple wives if you don't have a marriage license. Reynolds versus United States tells you that. That it's from the 1800s. If he didn't have a marriage license, he can have multiple wives. Because the state's out of but it. since we signed the state's contract, you have to follow their rules. And it's just that simple. If you write your own contract, if your wife says, yeah, I'll marry you, but you can't marry anybody else. If you put that in the contract, can you marry someone else? No. No, you're in breach of contract now. Right. So why don't we regulate our own marriage contracts? Yeah. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> you can. Here's the difference. If you have a marriage license, you get the state's benefits. If you don't have a marriage license, you don't. So you can't write off your taxes, your children. You can only write off your taxes of your children if they have a birth certificate and you have a marriage license and you have all of their contracts in place. You don't get their benefits. See, do you want God's benefits or do you want the United States benefits? Tax benefits aren't there. They're trying to bribe yeah. you. No, they're not. It's, it's, it's not even worth it. No. Yes? No. Doesn't the New Testament say that the man should be a husband of one wife? Well, that, 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 that's for a deacon. And it, it's a good policy, but I'm going to talk to you about it. Let me, let me finish this. Polygamy is only illegal if you have a marriage license. Polygamy is a social status. Marriage is God's business model. We think of it emotional today. Marriage is not emotional. It's a business model. If, there, if the father is the owner of a private business, he would have several sons. These sons would start and manage supporting business. And he'd build his enterprise. Henry Ford did that in America. He did. Exactly like God said. And look how successful he was. The competition to this is called a corporation. Corporations are the state's business model. The state is a corporation. I went over that several lessons ago. They recruit businesses to incorporate under them. This is how the state reproduces. So marriage is the common law equivalent to a vertically integrated corporation. How corporations are tiered and build a business model? God's model was marriage and you build through your family. 
So what's polygamy for? Alright? Who should be polygamous? Rich people. Very successful and wealthy people. You have to be able to afford it. Yeah. There, none of us should be polygamous. I'm just going to be blunt about it. Like, none of us should be polygamous. Yeah. You don't marry multiple wives for pleasure. <laughs> okay, I'll just put it that way. So why are you yeah. teaching us? We could be out of here, right? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Small business owners and those who work for wages should not be polygamous. There's no reason for us to do it. This is for a very small few. If you think about the people in the scripture, it was David. Saul. These were the biggest, most powerful people in the land. Regular old people weren't. Abraham, he was a, we don't realize, but if you count the number of cattle he had, he had hundreds of men for servants. How many servants do you guys have? How many do you have working for you? Some of us might have one or two, but we're not like, you know, so big. This is supposed to be our family and a family enterprise. I can't even afford one wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, adultery has 11 statutes. You shall not lie carnally with another man's wife. That's pretty common sense. If a man lie with a virgin not engaged, he must endow her to be his wife. If we did this, this is where shotgun marriages came from. Yeah. So fornication results in marriage. Yeah. It's just that simple. So there'd be a lot more marriages or a lot less fornication, one or the other. It's going to solve one problem or the other. If the father refuses, if the father refuses, then he must pay the bride price and dowry. So fornication, father doesn't want you to marry, you owe the bride price. This is a fraud, you guys. The father was defrauded of the value of his daughter. So the boy needs to pay. <laughs> Can you imagine how this is going to solve fornication? Mm -hmm. Yeah. God's brilliant. He really is brilliant. You shall not lie carnally with an animal. I probably don't need to convince you of that one, so I'll just keep moving on. <laughs> you shall not lie carnally with close family relatives. I probably don't need to convince you not to have incest. You shall not lie carnally with someone of the same sex. I probably don't need to talk about that with this crowd either, but homosexuality is wrong. It's always been wrong. The adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. So when you're caught in these crimes, it's the death penalty. A woman married who is believed to be a virgin and found not to be shall be stoned. So it's fraud, you guys. It's a marriage is serious to God if you really think about it. It's very serious. Um, tokens of her virginity be not found for the damsel. She's to be stoned. So you can't misrepresent yourself in marriage. You need to be upfront. An engaged woman shall not lie carnally with another man. This is adultery. So even through engagement, it's considered adultery. Uh, you shall not force another to lie carnally with you. That's rape. God does not endorse rape. But what you'll notice is the damsel must have cried. So it's not rape unless there's resistance. And that's the way the scripture reads. She has to cry out. She has to reject it. Whoredom is forbidden. Whoredom is prostitution. It's just forbidden. Male prostitution or female prostitution. Alright, the last couple of slides. Divorce. This should answer some of the questions. A bill of divorce must be written. We misunderstand divorce today. I'm just going to tell you we completely misunderstand it. All right, he, uh, if you want to divorce your spouse, you must write a bill of divorcement. A bill of divorce must be given to her hand. So you write it and then you give it to her. Once a bill of divorce is given, she must be put away. There are court cases that took bills of divorce without a marriage license and the judge knew how to construe it. It, it, it was valid. Well, without a mar with a marriage license, the judge knows exactly where to go and how to construe the law. With a bill of divorce, he's going to take the contract that they wrote and adjudicate based on that bill of divorce and their contract. The difference is who writes the contract. But this has been held up in court numerous times. It's a verbiage. Put it away. What's that mean? Oh, I'm going to get to that. Oh, sorry. Okay, this is where we misunderstand very often. A bill of divorce can be given to a married woman who is found to be unclean. Unclean is er erva, which means nudity, disgrace, blemish, nakedness, shame, or unclean. This word does not signify adultery. 
So divorce is not just for adultery or any of the uncleanness forbidden in Leviticus 18 because that would be punishable by death. This is where we get mixed up. Adultery does not go to divorce. It goes to death. You don't divorce an adulteress. The marriage is done because they die. So you don't... It, people misunderstood what the Messiah said in the New Testament. I'm going to explain that in just a minute. Yes? So in the spirit of the law, would that mean that the covenant is dead? The covenant's over at death. Yeah. So marriage ends by divorce or death. That's it. Um, and but today we don't take them out and kill them. So that then it never ends unless you divorce them. Because we're not following God's law, it won't end by death unless they just naturally die. A woman that is given a bill of divorce and is put away can remarry. That's an important one. She may go and be another man's wife if she's been given a bill of divorce. Okay, A woman cannot remarry her ex-husband if she has been married to someone else. So once they've been married to someone else and they've consummated, they can't get remarried. So if my wife and I got split up and she married someone else and then they got split up and we decided, hey, let's try and make another go at it, we can't do it. God said no. A man cannot take a second wife and then diminish the, his first wife or she is free to go without money. That's kind of important. She doesn't get her bride price. She doesn't get her dowry back. Okay, now let's, let's talk about divorce real quick. All right? First, biblical divorce must find some uncleanness. This is a breach of the contract. So what's your contract? If it's a marriage license, you got to follow what the state says. Right now, it's anything goes. Irreconcilable differences, whatever. Just if you feel like getting divorced, you can get divorced. If you write your own contract, what did you put in the contract? They have to breach the contract. Must write a bill of divorce and give it to her. This is a property right, you guys. This is her evidence and gives her capacity to remarry. Mm -hmm. If she doesn't have that bill of divorce in writing, no man's going to know that she can be married. She must leave your home. That's what put away means. Put her away. All right, let's, let's apply this to the New Testament. Was the Messiah wrong? Deuteronomy 24.2 says, And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. But the Messiah said, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, commits adultery. Mm. This, this is very misunderstood. Because we don't understand Deuteronomy 24. Okay. All right? Let's understand some definitions. All right? A bill of divorce is a document. Divorce is termination. These are two different things. Put away is a separation. It's annulment. That's the separation. Do people separate today without getting a divorce? Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Is it adultery if I see. Do you see where I'm going? I do. Adultery is the death penalty. You don't divorce someone for adultery. They die. Fornication is a fine. It's 50 shekels of silver. Annulment is what put away means. It's putting someone away without a divorce. These are the same terms we use today. Put away and divorced in Matthew 5.32 is the same word. Where's, for, where's fornication come in at all? This? I don't get that. Well, well it's fornication's right there. I'm going to explain that in just a minute. Okay. But this word put away and this word divorced is the same word. This is not the word for divorced. The King James translated it wrong and all of our new translations use the word divorced. It's not the word for divorced. Mm -hmm. This is a paluo, which means to freely, to free feel, freely relieve, release, to dismiss. This is not the word for divorce. Divorce is ap apostasian. Mm -hmm. We've translated it wrong because we think differently today and every modern translation translates it incorrectly. Mm -hmm. <coughs> In Luke 16, 18, the King James got it right. It's the exact same verse but from Luke. Put away and put away. Mm -hmm. <coughs> put away is separation without a divorce. Mm -hmm. Without a bill of divorce. It's not fair to a woman to separate from her without giving her permission to remarry. Mm -hmm. <coughs> That's what God hates. Mm -hmm. All right? So God does not hate divorce. 
it clearly says he hates putting away. This is separation without divorce. But we always assume he's saying, I hate divorce. Yeah. He says, I hate putting away. I hate separation. with. If you, if you need to divorce, if there's a breach in contract, make the decision. Yeah. But don't put the woman in limbo. That is completely unfair to her. After all, God himself had a divorce. How could it be wrong? He put her away, but he did it right with a bill of divorce. He divorced Israel. And by the way, did you notice God was a polygamist too? He was married to Judah and Israel. How many nations is he married to today? Well, I'm sure all the common law nations. He's probably got 30, 40, 50 wives today. He's a polygamist. It would make sense. He's the most powerful person in the universe. I'm sure his business is quite successful. Yes. Okay, because I was thinking when he when they asked, can they put them away for any reason? And talk about how you know if they over salted the meat or something like that. If that's in the contract, then yes. Who would put that in their contract? If that's in the contract and you both agreed you will not over salt my meat, and they over salt their meat, that's a breach of contract. Mm -hmm. Who would be foolish enough to agree to that contract? I don't know. But that's why we should write our own contracts. It will force you to think about what you're looking for in a spouse. Yeah. Vercel and I rewrote ours. We redid it just because of this very reason. And it was the best thing we ever did. You don't divorce someone for adultery. You put someone away for fornication. What does this mean? This is talking about the tokens of virginity. Adultery requires death. Marriage is ended by death, not divorce. Fornication, you put her away. That's an annulment. This is after consummation and the tokens of virginity are not found. The husband was defrauded. This is why Joseph wanted to separate from Mary. It uses the word put away. They weren't married yet. He found out she was pregnant. She must have committed fornication. I'm going to put you away privately before we're married. No divorce is needed because the contract was breached. Once the contract's breached, it was never ratified. The consummation ratifies the contract. If it was breached, you never had a marriage in the first place. You can put her away. Do you see how this is working? This brings up the doctrine of latches. The doctrine of latches is when a party has been guilty of latches in enforcing his right by great delay and lapse of time. So if you don't, if you fail to assert your rights in a timely manner, the doctrine of latches overtakes you and you lose. So you can't marry someone, find out they defrauded you, their tokens of virginity weren't found, and they defrauded you and say, well, let's give it a couple of years and then we'll see. You see what I'm saying? You got to do it timely. This is the doctrine of latches. It comes from Numbers 30. It says, if he holds his peace in that day that he heard it, all our vows stand. So you need to say it right away. I think the law in America is 30 days. You got 30 days. The scripture doesn't endorse 30 days. It just says you need to be timely. You need to make the decision. If, if, if you found out that there was a fraud, you act on it. If you continue the contract as is, you've ratified the fraud. That's what the doctrine of latches means. Okay, so if I agreed that someone's going to deliver me meat every Wednesday and Friday, and for a month straight, they just did it on Wednesday but not Friday, but I kept paying them, I'm sorry, the new contract is every Wednesday. That's the way the law would word it. Because you continued it, you need to stop it right away. That's what latches means. Your residence, if you've lived in a place for yes. 30 days, you, that's your place. You can see how all these laws and maxims of law come from the scripture. They no, really the do. Precedence. Yes. And this, this is not a law. It's a doctrine. It's not nearly as powerful or important as a law, but it's still, still something we live by and it comes from the scriptures. God's design is for marriage to be forever. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. But because of our sin, God permits divorce. That's what he said. For the hardness of your hearts, he wrote you this precept. Because we sin and we will break contracts, divorce has to be available for us. Is there going to be divorce in eternity? No, there's not even marriage. There's no sin, so there would be no need for it. But there's no marriage in eternity either. But for the time being, God allows for divorce because we do sin and we break our contracts. That's just the way it is. America used to keep this law. 
United States Supreme Court 1885 says marriage is the sure foundation of all that is stable and noble in our civilization. The best guarantee of that reverent morality which is the source of all beneficent progress in social and political improvement. The Constitution of Alabama says the following person shall be disqualified. Perjury, robbery, burglary, forgery, bribery, assault and battery on the wife, bigamy, living in adultery, sodomy and incest. We used to have punishments for this stuff. It wasn't the right punishment. The Supreme Court said 1986, condemnation of those practices is firmly rooted in Judeo-Christian moral and ethical standards. Sodomy was a criminal offense at common law and was forbidden by the laws of the original 13 states when they ratified the Bill of Rights. In 1868, when the 14th Amendment was ratified, the 14th, 13th and 14th Amendment changed a lot. But when they, when they were ratified, all but five of the 37 states in the Union had criminal sodomy laws. In fact, until 1961, all 50 states outlawed sodomy, pro uh, providing criminal penalties for sodomy performed in private and between consenting adults. Yeah. We used to keep these laws. We forgot about it. Capital felonies were bestiality, sodomy, and incest. The reality is we just had the wrong punishment. This should be all the adultery laws, capital felonies. Regular felonies were adultery, bigamy, prostitution, and rape. That should have been death penalty. We didn't do it quite right. What changed? We signed up for a new law with a marriage license. Whose fault is it? Ours. It's us. We made the mistake. Well, they conned us into it, but we made the mistake.